uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen and Anthony, for having me here. Um, um, yeah, maybe I should start with a, a small, uh, let's say, some some personal context as a disclaimer uh, before I hit off with the paper itself. Uh, I, I noticed that maybe I should really uh, uh, ask the University of Ghent to update my biography a little bit. Uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, um, have not been working at the University of Ghent anymore for, for Sorry. years, which is not, uh, not <laughs> it's, I should, it's, as I said, I should uh, take care of my own uh, digital trail, I guess, better. And um, now I've, I've uh, two years ago, I've, I've uh, moved on to another kind of job and uh, I've officially entered the ranks of the independent scholars now. Uh, and I have felt a need to uh, find uh, a, um, a topic which would be a little bit closer to home so I could uh, do that in, uh, let's say, my spare time. So, uh, in fact, I have abandoned the body stones for the time being, and I have found what I think is a fascinating subject in a... Uh, a philosopher who lived and worked in The Hague in the 18th century, uh, which allows me to uh, go to the archives and the libraries just on uh, a late Wednesday afternoon to find the materials I need. So uh, that's a bit of a background to, uh, well, how I came to this topic. It's also still, uh, well, let's say in its infancy, the project. So it's a kind of a pet project. So. Um, We'll all, uh, let's say that the conclusions will be a bit sketchy. Okay, well, that, here goes. Uh, the aim of my presentation and of the project in general is, is twofold. First, to give context to the life and works of Franz Hemsterhaus, a philosopher of the second half of the 18th century. But second, also to suggest a new way of looking at elite culture in a problematic period in the history of the Dutch. Republic. Historians tend to celebrate early modern Dutch society as open, egalitarian, and tolerant. The Dutch Republic is seen through the lens of a civic ideal, a state liberated from the rule of the Spanish monarchs led by urban professionals who were literate, critical, and pragmatic model citizens. The 18th century then is seen as a period of decline. Commercial competition gave way to rent seeking, unemployment was on the rise, city population shrank, and economic recession went hand in hand with political corruption. Urban patricians, the so-called regents, imitated the nobility they had superseded. They acquired estates in the countryside and titles to go with them. They circulated well-paid government positions among them. Army and Navy suffered neglect and foreign enemies repeatedly humiliated the Dutch state. The decline of the Republic was sealed by the return of the Stadtholders. These crypto monarchs had been all but banished to a rural backwater for almost half a century. But after France, invaded the Republic in 1747 during the War of Austrian Succession, the Prince of Orange was reinstalled to save the country. The new stadtholder, Prince William IV, died after four years and was succeeded by his three-year-old son, William V. And the government was overseen first by his mother, Anne of Hanover, and then by the army commander, Ludwig Ernst von Braunschweig, known colloquially as the Fat Duke. And maybe you can imagine why he had this nickname looking at this picture. It was during the dominance of the Fat Duke between 1756 and 1782 that Dutch administration really turned into a kleptocracy of sorts. Well, disgruntled Republicans united in the so-called Patriot Movement. In 1785, they chased away the Stadtholder. And for two years, these patriots ran the show. But then the King of Prussia, Frederick William, came to the rescue of the Stadtholder, his brother-in-law, and German troops restored the Prince of Orange to his seat in The Hague. 
the brief Republican revival was nipped in the bud. It was the Dutch Revolution, which never was. Seven years later, French revolutionaries entered the Dutch Republic again. In the particularly cold winter of 1795, they crossed the frozen rivers and occupied the country. And this was the end of the Republic. The modern perception that in the 18th century, the Dutch Republic declined steadily echoes debates of the period. A sense of dismay pervades commentaries on the state of government, on the economy, and on culture. Observers lamented the decadence of the ruling elites. The weakness of the Dutch nation was seen to be exacerbated by the spread of French morals, effeminate, disingenuous, frivolous. And I think there is a parallel there in English society in the period. Well, one thing about this narrative of the 18th century bothers me. Our understanding of intellectual preoccupations of the period is entirely shaped by the perception, of, by the perspective of degenerating republicanism. Historians tend to study patriot activists who rejected the quasi-aristocratic habits of patricians. And even when historians do cast their eyes on the opponents, the supporters of the stadtholders, the orangists, the matrix of interpretation is still that of failed republicanism. And I'll try to get away from the title at the bottom of this slide, which is actually, well, this is actually not that easy because I have to move in a mirror image, uh, which is one of the few, Biefer Velema is one of the few historians who have actually studied the orangist culture of the time. So intellectual history of the 18th century, uh, as I see it, is, is trapped in a Dutch exceptionalist framework, which only sees the loss of civic culture. What has eluded historians is what it was, that the Francophile quasi-aristocratic culture of the regions actually considered to be of value. What were the cultural and intellectual arenas where these regions felt at home? What subjects did they discuss? What practices did they develop? That is what I want to explore with a focus not on the waning commercial powerhouse, which was Amsterdam, but on the governmental city of The Hague. One word about the social structure of these regions, these patricians. For decades, historians have been discussing whether the 18th century Dutch Republic witnessed the process of aristocratization. Did the uppermost social strata close off to newcomers and constitute a new nobility? Well, the consensus is that they did not. The ruling elites remained relatively open to newcomers, and there was little conspicuous consumption to signal a new aristocracy. And indeed, there is little of the architectural or artistic exuberance on display in the surrounding countries. But again, I think this consensus requires some qualification. There could be considerable local variation. Whereas commercial and industrial cities such as Amsterdam and Leiden remained thoroughly bourgeois, in The Hague, the situation was different. After all, this was the center of government. As of 1747, administration was heavily conditioned by the Princess of Orange. The Hague became a court society centered around the stadtholder and also spatially centered around the stadtholder. And here I have a uh, map of the Hague of the time. So, yeah, it actually, it is, I think, well, do I have it? No, I think it is of 77, 47. Uh, and wait, this is not what I wanted to do there. There we are. I've marked. First, the two areas uh, on which the House of Orange, the princely dynasty, was, was focused. In the center, you see the Binnenhof, the inner court, 
which was the government compound. And I, I, at the top of that red area, you see the, the big pond, which, which is a very recognizable landmark of this government compound. On the, on the north of the map, you will see uh, the, the so-called old court, which was a private palace with a large garden outside of it. That, those were the two focal points of where the family of the oranges lived. Um, here you see a view of the pond of the Binnenhof, the inner court, which as you can see on the right, actually still looks pretty much the same. The, the carriage has just been replaced by bicycles, but that's all. Uh, and for the rest, uh, yeah, pretty much the same. The circling around this, this area, especially to the, to the northeast, were noble families who made their mark on social life in The Hague. Families, and I've, I've uh, put an arrow where, I, where the facades of the buildings are, which I will show now. There were the noble families, such as the, the Bentink family, who owned the largest palace on the avenue of the Voorhout. And for instance, the family of the Van Wassenaars, who also owned a pretty uh, palace in Louis XIV style on the, on the corner of the Voorhout. The homes of these noble families in The Hague were concentrated along the green avenue, circling the Binnenhof. In a wider circle still, civil servants and government personnel orbited these nobles, intermingling with them. And scattered among these Dutch social groups were the ambassadors of other realms who brought their own aristocratic cultures with them. So I like to see The Hague as an aristocratic microcosm with a corresponding culture. And I think we may fruitfully engage with this elite culture uh, as a world of dilettantes. Nobles and patricians pursued a broad range of interests, from amateur music to experimental natural philosophy, not as professions, but as opportunities for interaction. The dilettante did not aspire to material gain. He did not publish. He did not specialize. Rather, the dilettante engaged in conversation. He frequented closed clubs and private soirees. He collected objects, art, books, instruments, but he also gave them away just as easily. Intellectual and artistic treasures were the bargaining chips in a continuous game of social intercourse. That's the culture of the dilettante, which I want to explore, the dilettante culture of The Hague. And the person who will guide us is Franz Hemsterhaus. Um, there we are. And just, well, just to be sure, uh, our, I was just wondering, would the people who are familiar with the work of Franz Hemsterhuis raise their hand? I wanted to ask if you could raise your hand on the Zoom tool, but I don't know if that's necessary because the audience is not so large. Has, had anybody heard of Franz Hemsterhuis before? this session. I don't see any acknowledgement, so probably he's not such a famous figure. No. Uh, in the, well, let's say in the international community, I've come across his, his father, Tiberius. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Franz, Hester, Franz Hemsterhaus is best known as a, as a philosopher. And he is considered one of the founding fathers of modern aesthetics. His motto was, je sens and see, je suis, I feel, and therefore I am, modifying the cogito ergo sum of Descartes. He published a number of brief works, letters and dialogues in French. Hemsterhaus was born in 1721, indeed, the son of the famous classicist Tiberius Hemsterhaus. Actually, the first name of Tiberius was Tjebba, which is a first name common in the very rural province of Frisia in the Northwest, they have a special way of, of talking, they're very melodious, so they would be Tjebba Hemsterhuis, so, but he Latinized it to Tiberius Hemsterhuis. And this elder Hemsterhuis held a chair in classical languages at Leiden University. 
His son Franz established himself in The Hague in 1750 as a civil servant. And The Hague would remain his place of residence until he died 40 years later. He would always remain a simple clerk at a government body called the Council of State. Outside his works, uh, I, uh, sorry, outside his, his, his work as a clerk, Hemster has developed uh, ideas on the way human beings relate to each other and to the world around them. And I'll sketch these ideas very briefly. Now, I'm going back one for a second. The central theme of all his works is that souls aspire to ever closer union. One soul can affect another soul. And the stronger two souls impress each other, the more they become as one. He was a Neoplatonist. This concept is foundational for the themes that Hamster House subsequently developed. Now, I will touch upon three of these themes. There goes. First of all, beauty. Beauty is the effect of an object which generates a maximum number of impressions on a human soul in a minimum amount of time. The faster we grasp an idea embodied in an object, the more beauty we experience. Also, the more ideas this object confers, the more beautiful it is. So an object which has a unity of style and composition, such as a typical classical or neoclassical work of art, is most beautiful because it allows our souls to grasp many ideas in the shortest time span. Another theme is desire. Desire is the yearning of any soul for as many impressions as possible in the shortest amount of time possible. And the more similar something or someone is to our soul, the more fully it will speak to our desire. The less obstacles stand in the way between our soul and its object of desire, the stronger the fulfillment. Our senses, our sight, our uh, touch, every, the senses are uh, necessary, of course, for absorbing impressions, but they're also, in fact, obstacles to enjoying the object of our desire. But the obstacles between us and our objects of desire are also the sources of civility. Our clothes, our, our, our moderated behavior, but also our differences in character constrain us in the total fulfillment of our desire. Um, but at the same time, they mitigate the, the difference between the object and the subject. The third theme uh, is uh, morality. And morality, according to Hamsterhaus, is the receptivity of a soul to impressions from other souls. Hamster has suggested that we have a sixth sense, which he called the moral organ. The more sensitive our moral organ, the easier we are affected by beauty and virtue. The moral organ moderates our selfish impulses. It enables us to become attuned to the creatures around us. And since every person has a moral organ of a different quality, Everyone is also able to relate to other people to different degrees. Okay, so I, for now I will limit myself to these three aspects of Hamster House's aesthetics and ethics. Uh, I think these were fundamental to his views of human beings in their society, and they were particularly relevant to the elite society in which he moved. And here a few aspects are important, which I will highlight. First of all, Hamster House's ideas of morality and beauty were strongly linked. Both were the effect of souls being impressed by the external world. Beauty was a quality of the object being observed, observed, and morality was the quality of a subject confronting objects around him. So these two were, were complementary. The beauty of an object was to be grasped by the morality of a subject. Okay, 
then the, se the, the extent to which people could perceive beauty and behave morally depended on the quality of their moral organ. Some people were born with a moral organ which was better developed than others. And this implies that some people were morally superior to others by birth. This justified a hierarchical society. Each individual had a natural place within the moral hierarchy. People higher up on the moral ladder could be held to higher moral standards and also had greater moral responsibilities. This runs counter to the egalitarian reputation of the Dutch Republic, which I talked about at the beginning. Uh, wait, I'm going too fast. A third point I wanted to highlight is that insofar as people were different and failed to homogenize, they required external constraints to maintain a peaceful society. And these constraints were social conventions. People controlled their vocabulary, their mimicry, their gestures, so as not to give offense. Such conventions were the cement of bourgeois civil society. But for Hemsterhaus, civil conduct was not an ideal, but a necessary evil. It was a remedy against the poorly developed moral organ of plenty of people around him. And with this in mind, I would like to mention a brief text, which is an obituary which Hemster has wrote for a good friend of his, who died at the age of 33. The title is Philosophical Representation of the Character of the Late Mr. François Fagel. And we will repeatedly encounter this François Fagel later on, uh, who was a well, particularly uh, important member of the regent class. Hemster has made a sharp distinction between Fagel's public and his private persona. The people at large knew Fagel's intelligence, his wisdom, his eloquence, his liberality, in one word, his civic virtues. But Hemsterhaus continues, in private company among his friends, Fagel showed his real character. He would express anxieties, discontent, jealousy even, this was the beauty of friendship, of love, of souls becoming as one. Hemsterhaus actually opposes the somewhat shallow beauty of civic virtue to the deep beauty of private love. And we will see how this connects with the elite culture of The Hague in a minute. But first, a few words about Hemsterhaus's fortune in historiography which I think is a perfect illustration of the rather narrow vision of 18th century Dutch history, which I sketched at the beginning. Because actually Hemsterhaus has been all but ignored by Dutch historians. German philosophers, specialists of the history of ideas have studies, studied his works, mostly in the context of the rise of romanticism and idealism. A few Dutch historians have examined his Platonism, his Newtonianism, his aesthetics. We have thus come to know Hemsterhaus mainly as a disembodied set of ideas. And in the history of philosophy, Hemsterhaus remains a somewhat odd figure, a bit similar to Giambattista Vico, an original thinker living in an intellectual desert. Naples, in the case of Vico, the Hague in the case of Hemsterhaus. His authentic, slightly quirky writings did not influence any of his compatriots. He had virtually no following in the Dutch Republic. It were the great German pre-romantics who were inspired by Hemsterhaus and who saved him from oblivion. So Hemsterhaus would seem to be an anomaly in the 18th century Dutch Republic. Hardly anyone has appreciated how the thinker Hemsterhaus fitted in with the society in which he spent most of his life, the court city of The Hague. It is illuminating to read Diep van Bunge's assessment of Hemsterhaus, published in his book, uh, From Bell to the Batavian Revolution, two years ago. The title of the chapter on Hemsterhaus is The Philosopher as an Escape Artist. 
Von Böhmerthing's hamster house ignored the important issues of his day. He hardly knew Spinoza, Locke, Hume, Voltaire. And when he did discuss Spinoza, for instance, he doesn't seem to have understood him very well. Exasperated, von Bunge notes that the only philosopher whom Hemsterhuis seems to have studied was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It was Rousseau's notion of the pure human condition, unspoiled by civility, which appealed to Hemsterhuis, as you can imagine. In their primeval state, people had to rely on their moral organ for their mutual relations. But when people started to acquire possessions, society introduced law and religion, and the moral organ fell into disuse and lost its sophistication. Hemsterhuis's ideal, in tune with Rousseau's natural state, was to recover the capacity of being impressed by sound, sights, sounds, and scents, and taste and touch. Well, Van Bunge seems slightly disgusted by Hemsterhuis's celebration of passivity, not acting, but feeling. For Van Bunge, this amounts to a withdrawal from the world, an escape from the harsh reality of a republic in disarray. But in my opinion, it deserves more positive appreciation. In fact, no, I don't know. In fact, Hemsterhaus has written wonderful letters in which he describes how he could revel in being in a state of complete passivity, opening himself to the sensations of the world while he was standing in the wind on one of the sandy dunes which protect the Hague from the sea. Passivity, according to Hemsterhaus, in passivity, aesthetics and ethics were joined. It was the ability to moderate our instincts by receiving impressions in our moral organ. It was a gift. And some people were endowed with this gift more than others. So in my view, he was not an escape artist at all. His theory of social interaction shifted attention from the public sphere to private relationship. In the intimacy of private company, the moral organ could cultivate sensitivity to objects of beauty and to like-minded souls. And this may, I think, have resonated well with the intellectual culture of the elites of The Hague. So let's see how that might have worked out. Um, Hemsterhaus was a solitary figure, philosophically maybe, but socially he was very active and well-connected. He built a large network of friends, including people of power and towering intellectual figures. So I'll give a brief overview of the circles in which he moved. First of all, Hemsterhaus was intimate with several of the most eminent members of the state administration. Some of them were patricians, regents, born in families which were virtual dynasties of civil servants. And we already mentioned François Fagel, his friend who died in 1773. Fagel's family inherited the position of first secretary of the parliament from father to son. Hemsterhuis was also close with members of the nobility, such as Willem Bentinck, whom we already met as a patron and as an owner of the largest palace on the Voorhout. All these families lived in an area of one square mile around the government buildings, a true microcosm, as I already pointed out. Hemsterhuis himself, I uh, noted it with the little cross on the map, lived just outside this area, across the water overlooking the gardens of the old court of the Orange family. And here you see a painting of the garden of the old court where in 1785, Blanchard, a uh, French uh, inventor, showed his balloon, which was let into the air. Actually, Hemster has uh, watched one of those, well, shows, experiments, however you want to call them. Uh, also, um, noting the psychology that he seemed to observe of the poor guy who fell off the balloon when it was in the air, and noting the expression of his face changed as he fell down. Uh, yeah. Um, where was I? 
Yeah, so Hemsa has lived just outside this, this area. Um, but he repeatedly visited the homes of his patrician and noble friends near the Binnenhof, who gave him access to the highest social strata of the Dutch society. And Hemsa was also in good standing with the princes of Orange themselves. In 1757, Hemster House was appointed first custodian of the princely cabinet of antiquities. So besides his duties at the Council of State, he was also responsible for overseeing the collection of busts, coins, medals, and gems of the Stadtholder. For the first time, these were housed in a dedicated building, the Weiverhof. I put an arrow where the Weiverhof is a palace facing the entrance of the government compound. You can see it in the corner uh, here, is the Vedro. This collection of antiquities was one of several princely collections with, which were put on display. And apart from antiquities, this Weiverhof also held the library and the natural history collection, which was actually a lot more spectacular than the collection of antiquities. Uh, William the Fifth. William the Fifth had a, a kind of zoo, the menagerie, just outside the Hague, and he, uh, from time to time, exotic animals arrived from Indonesia and Suriname, and usually they would die within half a year, and then they would be stuffed and moved to the natural history collection at the at the Vijverhof. And one of the pièces de résistance was this uh, giraffe, which was. Uh, constructed from a, a skeleton and a, a skin, which was sent in from South Africa. So there was natural history and a few buildings to the Northwest. Maybe you can see it here, this slender white building uh, that was built also in 1774, I think, especially for the collection of paintings of the Stadtholder, uh, which was put on display more or less in this way, as we are used to from early modern collections of paintings, which are just uh, hung on the wall as if the whole wall just have to, has to be covered with pictures, um, which they've tried to reconstruct now. So you can visit the gallery of William V uh, in The Hague, more or less as it used to look at the end of the 18th century. So, Hamster House here was at the center of a cultural system which the Stadthouder developed in a few years. As for the diplomats residing in The Hague, the Hamster House was intimate, particularly with one of them, the Russian ambassador, Prince Galitsin. And Galitsin was a colorful figure. He was a philosophical materialist. At home, he organized experiments with electricity. And he frequently hosted dinners where his guests discussed philosophical and scholarly topics. Uh, yeah, he was also in a house on the Voorhout. Um, here you see the house where Galitsin lived, more or less across from the house of Bentinck, just to give you an impression of how close everybody was to each other. And our hamster house could just cross the road to go from one patron to another. At the house of, Hamster, uh, of Galitzin, Hemsterhuis would meet foreign visitors, such as uh, Denis Diderot, who stayed there twice in 1773 and 1774. But the most important person in the circle was Galitzin's wife, Adelheid Amalia von Schmetau. Actually, pretty soon after they uh, came to live in The Hague, von Schmetau left her husband. Uh, and together with her two children, Mitri and Mimi, she rented rooms in a farm just outside The Hague. And for a few years, Hemsterhuis visited von Schmetau there almost daily. And they talked about the education of her children, about mathematics, about philosophy. This platonic intimacy lasted until von Schmetau moved to Münster in 1779. The last 10 years of his life, Hemster has visited von Schmettau in Germany several times, and through her, he got to know important German intellectuals personally, such as Goethe, Herder, and Jacobi. And it was Jacobi who drew Hemsterhaus into the Pantheismusstreit of the 1780s, 
with a commentary on Spinoza's monism. And in that way, Hemsterhuis became a minor, minor celebrity in the German Sturm und Drang. But more importantly, I hope it is evident that Hemsterhuis was by no means an isolated genius in The Hague. We can appreciate this if we widen the perspective from Hemsterhuis the philosopher, who fits in the genealogy of European ideas, from Joseph Addison through Hemsterhuis himself to uh, Herder. If we shift that perspective to Hemsterhuis, the intellectual omnivore who had a wide range of interests, which he practiced as a social pastime. And I want to briefly mention an article which appeared 10 years ago, which I wanted to put on a slide, but I realize now that I forgot to do so, by Herman Rodeburg, who wrote about the politics of distinction of the nobility in The Hague. Rodeburg sees the, these nobles profess sprezzatura, the art of being good at something while pretending not to bother. I think this culture of sprezzatura and dissimulazione, going back to Castiglione's Libro del Cortigiano, took root much wider among the patricians who imitated the nobility. The entire governing class of The Hague pursued artistic and intellectual interests while hardly producing anything visible and durable. And the surviving letters of Hemsterhuis, of which we know approximately 2,500, give us insight in these circles of amateur philosophers, entomologists, numismatics, etc., etc. So in what remains, I will give some impressions of the study of nature and of antiquarianism, both very social intellectual pursuits for Hemsterhuis. The experimental study of nature was one of the fields in which the elites of The Hague reveled. Hemsterhuis himself held a particular fascination for optics, astronomy, and geometry. He closely followed the attempts by two rival instrument makers to develop an improved telescope. And we find him also designing his own binocular telescope at a certain point. And he shared his observations on telescope design with prominent inhabitants of The Hague, such as his noble friends, Hans Willem van Alva, and a bibliophile regent, uh, Gerard Neerman. And Hemsterhuis also discussed astronomy with Ambassador Galitzin and his wife. In 1776, the ambassador informed Hemsterhuis of an upcoming eclipse of the moon. And Hemsterhuis went to see it from the garden at Lady von Schmetta's farmstead, where it was nice and dark. But the interest in nature was not limited to optics and astronomy. When Diderot visited The Hague and stayed with Galitzin, uh, he was witness to a dinner at the ambassador's house, and Hemsterhuis was one of the guests. Diderot remembered Hemsterhuis talking about the hydrostatics of beer. Other topics discussed at the table were the genitals of indigenous African women, the electric discharges of the electric eel, and a fisherman who had grown to be over seven feet. The friends and patrons of Hemsterhuis were interested in natural history and philosophy too. Among them was Willem Bentink, the noble patron of Hemsterhuis, living across the street from Galicien. Bentink encouraged the teacher of his kids, Abraham Tremblay, to study freshwater polyps. And Bentinck promoted the posthumous publication of Tremblay's work together with Francois Fagel, Hemsterhuis's good friend who died at such a young age. Wait. Well, the social context in which these studies took place was not always friendly. As a custodian of antiquities, Hemsterhuis had to share the Weiverhof with the supervisor of the natural history collection, obviously, Arnold Vosmaer and the two men hated each other. In 1776, the stadtholder acquired a living orang-utan from Indonesia. The animal died within a year. Hamster has his friend, Petrus Kamper, who studied comparative anatomy, was promised the body to dissect it. 
But Vosmaer, as soon as the animal died, had it stuffed for his natural history collection. Amsterhuis took offense, the stadtholder got involved, and a public row ensued, known as the Orang Uten War of 1777. Well, these are rather sketchy observations concerning the interest in nature of Hemsterhaus and his friends. There's no coherent program for the study of nature here. But that is actually the point. This was a culture in which studying nature, like discussing philosophy, was a pastime. The refined taste, the, the moral organ of these noble souls naturally inclined them towards observing the created world. And the world, in turn, impressed them with the beauty of its mathematical regularities and ingenious creatures. Well, let's have a look. And do I still have some time left? Yeah, I think so. Even more than natural history, the elite of The Hague, including Amsterhuis, were enthusiastic about antiquarianism. An enthusiasm, uh, sorry, an enthusiasm which historians have largely ignored. And this interest was closely related to Hemsterhaus's aesthetics and ethics. We can see an admiration for Greek culture running through all of Hemsterhaus's activities. He considered ancient Greece the best model for a society where people allowed themselves to be affected by the world around, without inhibitions. The best society, in short, to enjoy beauty. And he saw himself as the Batavian Socrates. His love for all things Greek also pervades his antiquarian dealings. Being the son of a famous philologist goes without saying that Hemsterhaus was familiar with ancient languages and culture. But his own approach to antiquities was very different from his father's, not as a philologist, but as an aesthetic. His first publication, in fact, was an, a printed antiquarian letter. The Lettre sur une pierre antique of 1762. And it discusses an engraved amethyst from Hellenist Sicily, which belonged to an Amsterdam banker. Hemsterhaus was asked to express his opinion on this stone. And he deemed the spirit of the drawing and the composition, the delicacy of the execution, and the perfection of the internal shine to indicate a Greek work of the best quality. We hear the voice of a connoisseur who combines technical expertise with stylistic judgment. But Hemster has also compared this engraved gem to an ancient medal belonging to the Stadtholder, which signals his familiarity with the princely collection, which had a large number of coins and medals. William V, for instance, owned a pair of medals found 50 years ago in a gold hoard which were rare pieces, and Hemsterhaus was aware of it. They were actually, well, not considered the most beautiful of pieces. They were actually very pretty plump, large, late antique pieces, but they were very rare. And Hemsterhaus not only admired these medals, he also went to pains to acquire the documentation of the dig with drawings and letters discussing them. And the elites of The Hague emulated the stadtholder in collecting antiquities. Browsing the correspondence of Hemsterhuis, we encounter many patricians and nobles who collected ancient artifacts. Francois Fagel, for instance, the friend of Hemsterhuis, collected ancient coins and medals, and we, heard, uh, we learn from Hemsterhuis's letters that he repeatedly mediated between Fagel and traders in antiquity, which sometimes conflicted with Hemsterhuis's duties for the stadtholder. Willem Bentink, the noble patron of Hemsterhaus, was involved as well. In 1771, we find Hemsterhaus invited to lunch by Bentink. And on that occasion, Bentink brought out a chest he acquired in England. He showed his guests what was inside, a bunch of bandages with a resin-like mass inside. They thought it was an Egyptian mummy, and Bentink had it examined chemically. Currently, the chest in the possession of the National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden is considered to be an 18th century fake. In a letter of 1763, Hemsterhuis commented on the cabinet of antiquities of the Count of Bassenaar. 
Hamster has noted that he still had no chance to inspect it, despite his good relationship with the family, which made him suspect that the Wassenaar collection probably wasn't a big deal, and others have confirmed this. So anyway, the eminent families of The Hague collected antiquities, they compared their collections among each other, and Hamster House was used to gaining access to them, probably as an arbiter of who had the finest treasures. And there is a parallel in England in this period, where the elite amateur was cultivated by the Society of Dilettanti, founded in the 1730s. These were Hellenist symposiasts combining serious study with play and jest. And typical was their energetic curiosity spanning a wide range of subjects, including natural studies, history and antiquarianism, and art, all pursued with enthusiasm without any premeditated specialization. I think we have a similar culture of dilettante antiquarianism in The Hague. The Hamster House was deeply involved. This was not a society with grand collections of Greek sculpture and Egyptian artifacts, as in the neighboring countries, but in the, their pedestrian way, the dilettante aristocrats of The Hague had the same love of the ancients. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with a couple of concluding remarks. Early modern The Hague is not known for its rich cultural patrimony. In fact, we know very little of what the elite in The Hague was up to in the late 18th century. The Dutch Republic was disintegrating, and the patricians and nobles living around the court of the Princes of Orange did little to save the Republic. But what they did spend their time on, we are not very well aware of. Perhaps the elite culture produced little of permanent value. But there are traces of a broad interest in various cultural pursuits for leisure and conversation rather than for professional development. These included a taste for art, an interest in science and philosophy, and knowledge of the classics. It was very different from the civic ideal of the vir virtuous bourgeois. It was much closer to the decadent culture of French aristocracy. Well, this un-Dutch culture of dilettantism may fit the peculiar philosophy of Hemsterhuis rather well. His exaltation of passivity, exposing oneself to the beauty of art and to the love of like-minded people, is alien to the active public engagement of enlightenment patriotism. But it accorded well with the private enjoyment of intellectual and artistic accomplishments by the ruling classes of The Hague. And Hamster has exemplified and served that elite culture perfectly. We have seen his wide range of interests, not only pre-romantic philosophy, but also natural studies and antiquarianism, as well as art, pedagogy, and psychology. And what is more, he was very well connected with many fellow practitioners of these subjects. He discussed all these interests in letters and at the dinner table. It was like his bosom friend, François Fagel, who shed his public persona when among intimates. Hamster has disclosed his true soul only to those he loved, not to the wider public. This was not a world of civic virtue made visible through public service. It was a world of private enjoyment of ideas and art. And its lack, its lack of visibility was not due to a lack of talent. It was intentional. The consequence of the sprezzatura of a ruling class, which preferred to keep their interests to themselves. Well, that's about it. Thank you very much.